great father, we know that we live in times and in a world where there are going to be storms. And we just thank you that you are with us in the midst, that we can praise you, thank you, and know that you are by our side no matter what it is that we are going through. And so, Lord, as we study this psalm, uh, talking about that very concept that, yes, there are storms, but in the midst, you are there. Would you speak to us? We need to hear this, Lord Jesus. And so I just ask that uh, you would, that, that we, we welcome you to speak to our hearts, and we invite you to speak to our hearts as we ponder the reality and the truth of what we're going to be studying today. And so we commit um, all the things that are going on around us personally, in our country, internationally. We just ask, Lord, that your perfect will will be accomplished in each of those areas. And Lord, how we thank you and praise you that you are on your throne. You are on your throne, mighty God. And so we cling to that truth. We embrace that truth and help us now to apply it and live it in our lives that you are in control of not only us, our country, but all around the world, you are in control and you know what is best. And so we cling to that truth. Speak to us today, Holy Spirit, is my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, amen. Um, I'm scooting my this thing over a little bit. And um, anyway, good to see you all. It's good to be home, I think. Here we, I always say that, don't I? It is wonderful to be home. And, um, and I'll tell you what, did that Marilyn do a job? Give her a hand. She, she can't hear you, but she'll probably sense it. But yeah, she did an amazing job. We are so blessed to have such an amazing uh, teaching team. And um, she is just amazing. I got to listen to every bit of it and um, loved it, loved it, loved it. She's amazing. So anyway, but today we are moving on through the Psalms of Ascent. We are in Psalm 124, and you have that on the top of your page in your book, and it says the, the subject matter is called help. And when you see that, don't you kind of want to go, help? Do you ever feel that way? And that's kind of, uh, I think, what the psalmist is trying to talk to us about. And so as we begin, the first concept that we want to think about is that, A, on your outline, life is full of hazards. Is that news to anybody? Yeah. Is there anybody here that has never had a hazard in their life? Wow, I, every one of us, because that is the world that we live in, isn't it? We live in a world of hazards. So the truth of that is just gripping. Life is full of hazards. And we're going to be looking at that in depth. Why, how, and so forth, and God in the midst of it. But as I was studying this early on, uh, it was right in the middle of, while we were watching that hurricane, the last one, uh, of the season, Idalia, I think it was her name, I never got that one right, but anyway, it was an eye storm, and we were kind of watching it, see where it was coming, and we were really concerned, is it coming to South Florida, and then we have now this extra concern, is it going to be in South Carolina, because of family there, and all that, and we're just watching, 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 and then as I was putting the final touches of study on this lesson, we heard what is going on in Israel today. And we, as we study this this week, all that's going on and what a need there is for us to be in prayer for what is going on internationally around the world and in, in Israel and um, for that situation, families torn apart, children brutalized, but God is in the midst. And he is still on his throne. And that is what we want to embrace this morning. And we want to take that out, wh whether we're talking about hazards internationally, nationally or whatever, or personally, God is in the midst and he is on the throne. Uh, I, uh, many, many times, Bob has come home after a, a long day of counseling and different things. And 
kind of huh, sits down in his chair. And we look at each other and we say, how could anybody survive this world full of hazards if they were not believers? If we did not know that, that God was on his throne. And um, it, it's just, and that's kind of what we feel as we're look, beginning to look at this psalm, Psalm 124, because it begins, if the Lord had not been on our side, that's in, in the NIV translation. And that begs a great question. And actually, many of us have asked this. In fact, I bet every one of us have asked this at some point in our life where we say, why would a loving and all-powerful God allow suffering at all? Has that ever crossed your mind? Has, how does he allow suffering at all, especially innocent people like children or things like that? How does this happen? How does God allow these things to happen? And here's the answer. You ready? We don't know. We don't know. We have no idea. But the biggest thing to remember is that our minds, what our minds are like compared to the indescribably big, omnipotent, all-knowing, and let me add this very quickly, all-loving God, we have no comprehension of that mind because our minds are so small. This is not even a molecule of a good comparison, but it's kind of like comparing an ant to a human brain. And again, that's not even remotely close to comparing the human mind to our mighty God's mind. So for us to try and figure out, oh, well, why did this happen? Or, you know, why does uh, suffering happen? Uh, it, it's kind of like we're trying to evaluate things from an ant brain, only probably even smaller, maybe a dot somewhere or whatever of, of dust. We all know of examples when we see in action a purpose in a suffering situation. Every one of us could repeat a situation where we observed that, as God said in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good, meaning even the suffering, even the difficulty, God is saying will work together for good. That is what he has said in uh, Romans 8, 28, and also Genesis 50, 20 basically says the same thing. What you meant for harm, God meant for good. And there's so many examples um, biblically of that truth. And one of them, uh, just a few to talk about some of the biblical ones, Joseph, remember, sold into slavery as a young man to Egypt. Uh, and in all things, this Jewish boy um, becomes what happens. He, he's a slave for a while, then he's thrown in prison for a while. And uh, we don't know exactly how many years elapsed between all the things that happened from the time he was hauled off to Egypt in a slave caravan, wow, uh, and then sold into slavery, and then finally when he ascended the throne in Egypt as a prime minister, and look what happened. He was able to save his entire nation. Or how about, how about Esther? I love that story. That's one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, where this young woman, probably in her early teens, was hauled off to the palace in Persia, a pagan, dark palace, and she becomes the queen of this pagan, dark man. And, you know, we kind of think, oh, fairy tale, she gets to go to the, to the palace. Wrong. <laughs> this was no fairy tale, believe me. And someday we can ask, no, we don't want to ask. But uh, you can only imagine the darkness that she, this little Jewish girl, experienced coming into this pagan castle, palace. But what does she do? She saves her entire country, her entire people from genocide. All things work together for good. Amazing. Wow. And getting a little bit more modern, how about five missionary young men who were, uh, had stellar minds and an education, and they gave up stellar career opportunities and went to South America and were brutally, brutally uh, murdered by the very people that they had gone to minister to, Jim Elliott and his friends. And um, 
you know, were like, wow, Lord, I mean, how you could have used these men. I mean, they could have had these lucrative, wonderful jobs and sent money to South America to, you know, to fund uh, missionaries. And, and wow, they went and they, they're killed. And then Elizabeth Elliot, remember, the wife, what does she do? She goes back to Ecuador and South America to minister and many, 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 many people in that area are now going to have gone or will be going through the gates of splendor, the name of her book that she wrote regarding uh, Jim Elliot, her husband. All those people, wow, the death of five amazing men, but it brought about people that are going through now the gates of splendor. God has a plan, doesn't he? All things work together for good. And these are just a few of how God ha redeems suffering. In those times of inexplicable suffering uh, that are going, that's going on around us, there are few things to think about. And here they are. B, we must trust what we do know. <laughs> There's much, much, much. I mean, we can't even, we don't even know how much we don't know about God. But there are some things that we do know about God. First, we don't know his plan and why he allows or what he does in the midst of that suffering. That's the first thing, number one. Number two, we do know our God is powerful and completely loving. Let me say that again. Our God is powerful and completely loving. He is a benevolent Father. I love that Jesus in the Lord's Prayer that we studied last year uh, told, gave us the, the title Abba, which is a, a personal, respectful, but personal name for God, Father. And we're, we're to call him Father. He views us as his children, his daughters, doesn't he? And would a father turn a cold, uncaring back on his child? No, he would not. In fact, Jesus uh, gave that illustration where even an earthly father, a sinful uh, earthly father, would never give a snake to a child that asked for bread. How much more a loving, perfect, all-knowing, powerful God would not do something like that to a child? Do we live in a world of problems? Yes. Um, they are a reality of life. And this psalm addresses that dilemma. Psalm 121 instructed us not to look at our own means for help, uh, but instead to look to one who made heaven and earth. We, we studied that a few weeks ago. And he is the one who is sovereign and knows and cares and is participating in all the events of our lives and all the events around us. This psalm, Psalm 124, uh, elaborates and gives specifics about the types of situation that we need help from God in. So I'm going to read that, and you all follow along with me in your, in your Bibles or your Bible app or whatever. Psalm 124, verse 1. If it had not been the Lord who was at your side, let Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was at your side when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us, uh, swallowed us alive when their anger was kindled against us, when the floods would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, and then over us uh, would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have es escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Finally, verse 8, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, who made heaven and earth. So see on your outline, what is the tone of the psalmist in times of hazards? We've already established <laughs> life has hazards, the world has hazards, but what is the tone that the psalmist takes? First, notice that uh, as he has intense feelings, number one, he repeats himself for emphasis. He repeats himself for emphasis. And haven't you felt that way, your problems or someone else? Um, you know, you feel it so strongly as that maybe a friend of yours is going through a difficulty or you're going through a difficulty. And the psalmist felt it so strongly, he repeats him, himself. But what he is affected by is God's goodness to him, God's goodness to him in times of peril. It's almost like he's beyond words. He's like, oh, my goodness. You know, these things happen. Perils happen. Hazards happen. 
things come, uh, water uh, flowing over us and all these things happening, but praise be to God that he is aware of that. He is so affected by God's goodness to him in times of peril that he's beyond words. It's not the whine of a person in trouble. Oh, God, help me, help me, help me. It's like, praise the Lord that you're there in the midst of what we're going through. Number two, he sings a song in confidence from a one who's experienced it, one who knows that life has its pitfalls, but God is the one who can be counted on is the point that the psalmist is portraying to us. So what are the types of dangers? What are the types of dangers? First, A, ferocious beasts. What does that mean? Well, let's read the verse. Then they would have swallowed us al alive. Then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was uh, kindled against us. Obviously, it's not literal, but notice the phrase swallow us, swaddle. Thank you. Help me with that. Swallowed alive, number one. What are examples then? What does that mean then? What, is it, what, what were the kinds of things that would have swallowed them up uh, then? What were the realities he was referring to? He, he's using a picture of a ferocious beast that swallowed up its victim. And it gives a picture of being outmatched in strength so that there was no escape something that was coming against them, that there was just no way we could escape this kind of ferocious uh, beast, quote, unquote. But what about today, number two? What are our examples now? How about this one? Dealing with difficult people that feel so overwhelming that it feels like being pursued by a ferocious beast? Or how about this? Maybe somebody in your uh, extended family or neighborhood or workplace or whatever that's vehemently opposed to Christianity and like, you believe that? And, and just really firmly opposed to um, what we believe. Or how about this? How about being the victim of somebody else's sin? How about somebody in your family who maybe um, continually broke the law or something like that and, and maybe there's a, a fear of the consequences that might come upon you or the family or something. Sometimes that can happen too can it? Well, we're the victims of somebody else that's close to us. So that's the first one, number A. What was it again? Ferocious beast. B, what about swirling torrents? What's that all about? Look at verse 4 and 5. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Number one, what were some examples then? Unannounced catastrophes. And in the Middle East, uh, due to the desert terrain during the rainy season, sudden flash floods could suddenly engulf you. And one day might be a, more, a normal day, making plans for the future, and then suddenly your life caves in because of something that you were not planning for. Notice the progression in the verses. A flood first, and then the torrent, and then the raging water. Notice how it's increasing in intensity. You know, it seemed kind of scary at first, and then, woo, it got really scary, and wow, this is devastating. You can see the building here that the psalmist is developing. Number two, what are some exa uh, examples now? Um, how about like during hurricane season? Do you love it where, you know, there's one that's kind of out there in the ocean, and then you turn on the weather, and you see... A1A covered with water and uh, vehicles overturned and, you know, boats on the beach that are, you know, met. and what happens to us? We start going, oh, what if that one touches ground and that happens to us? And, we, and it just builds our fear, doesn't it, when we uh, observe things like that. The intensity of the problem growing until it feels like a raging flood. I think there are two types of problems that are natural problems of living in a fallen world. A, first, vicious people. They would have swallowed us alive, as it says. Now, um, this is sort of a confession, but being married to a, a leader has some amazing, amazing blessings, but um, 
one of the most painful parts for me, being a people pleaser, is when somebody uh, strongly disagrees with my husband yeah. and, you know, can be, somebody's laughing in this room, <laughs> <laughs> and they can become cruel in their words or in their actions. But haven't we all experienced that? When, when somebody maybe in the workplace is just, has it out for you or whatever, and, and it's very, very difficult when um, vicious people feel like they swallowed us alive. Or how about this one, B, painful situations. The floods would have swept us away, like natural disasters, illness, accidents, uh, pain, whatever. Uh, when we, the last time we drove back from North Carolina, we got just maybe a couple of hours into the trip, and I think we were like in South Carolina by that time. And then all of a sudden, the car started being real strange, and Bob kept trying to pull at the steering wheel, and he's going, I, I don't know if we should pull into a gas station or something, or what, what we should do. And um, I said, well, maybe it's just the road construction. You know, they're kind of, you know, not level and everything. So we kind of kept going, and um, we just, Again, he was just the whole time more nervous than he wanted to express to me because he's it's like, wow, and some of the noises increased a little bit as we got closer and closer to home in Florida. And then finally we pulled off of um, 595 and into our development area. And the minute we pulled into our development, there was like a crash. And Bob is just holding onto the steering wheel for dear life. And he, we went a uh, block, a block, a block to our home. And we pulled into our driveway, and the car went completely out of control. There was a crash. Turned out, you ready? We had a broken axle. Yes. And if the Lord had not been by our side, this could have happened. South Carolina, Georgia, North Florida but it happened in our driveway. Wow. Hazards happen, but God is in the midst. God is in the midst. Next hazard, C, Fowler's snare. Verse 7, we have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have, accept, uh, we have escaped. The preceding examples were things that um, can be seen or heard, like roaring beast or of raging torrents and so forth. This one is more of a subtle trap of one who would attempt to trap the godly, is what the psalmist is talking about here. So number one, what were examples then? Well, a fowler was one, literally, who set traps for birds. And the bird uh, would enter the trap unconscious of danger, and a net was thrown over them, and instantly freedom was lost to the bird. There's no way the bird could figure out how to get from out from underneath that net. It would flap its wings and uh, wildly and try everything he could, but he could not get out. So two, what are some examples now? How do we apply that to today? And it's such a picture of our lives in which the evil one lays a snare, a trap for our souls. It's a reference here to the enemy of whom the Apostle Paul said we are not ignorant of his devices in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11. Unfortunately, so often we're not alert and suddenly the net is thrown over us. And this is a picture that's used in Psalm 9, 15, we're not going to read them, but you might want to jot them down, 10, 9, 140, verse 5, just to name a few. But what is the parallel in Ephesians 6? We studied that, you know, a couple of years ago, and it was just so helpful as we looked at the fowler's snare in our lives. One of the most helpful scriptures is verses uh, in, in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. 
Now notice, Paul instructs us in this passage who the enemy is, how the enemy works, and how to fight the true enemy. Uh, verse 12 tells us our enemy is not one another. Sometimes we feel that way, don't we? Sometimes we feel like, oh, that problem person uh, in my family or in the workplace or whatever. But no, he's saying our, our enemy is not flesh and blood, but the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies. And then it describes him and his work in verse 11, like a foul snare, uh, the evil one's schemes. Interesting, the word in uh, Greek where this section of the Bible was written is methodeia. What does that sound like to you? Methods, methods, the methods of the evil one. The enemy knows just exactly what method to use with each one of us, doesn't he? He knows exactly our Achilles heel and goes right after it. Um, mine is, this is a confession time, are you ready? Mine is worry, 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 what if, what if, what if. Do you ever have that? And I, I, I just can't believe how so many nights I will be lying awake between, it's usually 1.30 to 3.30. And guess what my mind is doing? Worry, worry, worry. What if, what if, what if? And that he knows that that's an area to get me, to worry, rather than trusting and saying, God, what are you going to do in this situation? How are we going to, what, what, what's going on here? Rather than thinking about that, just going over and over in my mind, a well-plotted, individualized plan. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me plan to snare you and me. You love that I start coughing in the middle of what I just said. <laughs> okay. Anyway, are we surprised? No. Anyway, D, hazards beyond the external. These are all examples of things that can create difficulties and issues from outside forces. But what about the issues that are of our own making that God, through a relationship with Jesus, has spared us from? How about like this, punishment for sin. Without Jesus, we would be punished eternally, wouldn't we? Wow, he provided that. How about our growth in discipleship? If it were not for the Holy Spirit drawing us, teaching us, helping us to understand scripture, where would we be? Wow, he's given us his word to help us in those times of hazards in our lives. And what if God had not intervened and given us the truth, for example, of Ephesians 2.10, which is we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. All of us have a good work to do. All of us have been created in some way to uh, have a role and a job for the Lord. Think about what our lives, how boring our lives would be if we did not know we didn't have something to do for the Lord. We, you know what we'd be doing? Going to the grocery store, doing the laundry, making the beds, banging seats, this and that, this and that, this and that, and there would be no purpose in what, in our living. And, and God is saying, hey, I've saved you by giving you something to do for the kingdom's sake. Praise God for his love and mercy and grace. God provides the escape. God provides the escape. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce, great commentator, said, the, said this, <clears throat> these words direct our thoughts to God, who is the only sure help for his people and the on, only rightful object of our true devotions. Someone said this psalm is not about hazards, here it is, but about help. Not about hazards, but about help. The psalmist doesn't want us to be fearful and hopeless, um, you know, where we're awake half the night, worry, 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 what if, what if, what if. No, he wants us to get our mind focused on him and how he's going to provide um, for us. You know, I, I think sometimes as women, when we were growing up as, ch as, ch as little girls, and maybe I'm just talking about me, but um, I think we watch too many fairy tales. What do you think? 
too many Cinderella's that everything's going to work out great. And, you know, I get to marry the handsome prince and move into a palace. I did get to marry the prince, handsome prince, but anyway. <laughs> Um, but, you know, everything's going to be wonderful in a fairy tale. And we, I think we expose ourselves to such fairy tales some, sometimes that we're shocked when life happens. We can't believe it, that a hazard came uh, to, in our life. And, and we're in disbelief sometimes. Wow. However, in a very, there are very real dangers in a world that is ha hazardous around us. But in the midst of that, God is there. In Ephesians 6, verse 10, it says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Let me read that again. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Similarly, similarly back to our, our psalm, if God had not been on our side, wow, what would have happened is what the psalmist is saying. So A, God provides his care. Our focus needs to be on his help, not hazards, number one. Help, not hazards. The word in that verse is, uh, uh, the word for God in that verse is Jehovah, which is, of course, Israel's personal name for God, the, the God of infinite power and perfection, our all-sufficient God. And so when there is trouble all around us, the fundamental reality is that Jehovah, the personal God, is on our side. Our trouble externally or internal issues that we have just discussed, we know that Jehovah, our God, is on our side. Number two, our hope is in the name of the Lord. All the facts can add up to doom. There's no way out. The beast has swallowed us alive, suffering from vicious people. Waters overwhelmed us, catastrophe, snares of the evil one caught, caught us. But for him. But for him. Psalm, verse 20, uh, Psalm 124, verse 6. Blessed be the Lord, but for him. Blessed be the Lord. The NIV puts it, praise the Lord. Just as we, uh, we would be torn up with problems, God intervened. Going back to the axle. Did we have a broken axle? Yes. Did we have to buy a new axle? Yes. Did we our car have to be towed away? Yes. Did I have to be without a car for a while? Yes. Those things happened, but in the midst, God was there. In the midst, God was there. It happened in our driveway, for goodness sake. Wow. So that's what we need to look at, isn't it? We need to say, okay, yeah, it happened, but for God, wow, he intervened. He took the, the, uh, the teeth out of that vicious beast. Wow, amazing, amazing, amazing. The snare has been broken. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Whether it's danger from vicious people, catastrophe, or enemy schemes, God is on our side. He is our help. The word, the, the name for God uh, in Hebrew for help, God is our help, is Jehovah Aser. Jehovah Aser. He is our help. In the midst, he wants to be our help. The names of God are so significant. I don't know if you've ever done a study uh, going over the names of God and the, and the significance of what they are and what they mean. It's just an amazing a look at all of who he is, his, his strength, his knowledge, his love, his help, as we just talked about. So B, what is our response? What is our response? Christians are not pious pretenders in the midst of a hazardous culture. We are witnesses to the fact that God is our help. In the midst of the dangers and perils that the rest of the world has to deal with, we need to be part of God's solution. Boy, right now with all that's happening in Israel, that we as Christians need to be so alert and watchful. Several of you have talked about having neighbors and uh, co-workers and so forth that are uh, of Jewish descent. I, there was a, one of our group leaders last night was telling how she has a neighbor who has um, friends and family 
in Israel right now, one has already died, and um, just our sensitivity to that. We need to be on such high alert right now to be absolutely making a difference in a time of difficulty in our world. We need to be ready. We need to be used by God in our spheres of influence, whether it's family, work, place, neighbors, whatever it is. We need to be aware of what's going on and be alert and be available to God. Psalm 124 is a mag magnification of the items that we tend to keep undercover. We don't like to look at unpleasant things in our lives. We like, when somebody says, hey, how are you doing? We like to say, oh, good, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, I'm having a good week. And, <laughs> and things might be catastrophe in our lives, but oh, okay, we're, we're good. I've told you this story a hundred times before, but in one of the churches a while ago that <coughs> uh, we used to go to when the kids were, were little, um, there was a, a man who was a greeter at one of the doors, and um, he, you would walk, I'd walk up to his, his door, and, um, and, and he'd say, how you doing? I'd say, oh, yeah, good, good. And I'd say, how are you doing? And he'd go, fantastic. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my goodness, then maybe you should be the one to get the kids ready for church on Sunday morning, feed them, and oh my goodness, one of them forgot their shoes, so we have to go back and get the shoes. Why don't you come over, and maybe you'll get a feeling of what life is like that isn't fantastic. <laughs> anyway, I oh, uh, just amazing. And it's sort of like we, we think it's ungodly or something to say, oh, you know, I'm glad I'm here. It wasn't a great morning, but, I, you know, we're here or whatever. We feel like it's sort of ungodly to be uh, realistic about some of our struggles that we're going through. We need to be open about those things, don't we? We need to be, um, you know, we, we need to be aware of each other. Life has problems in disasters. I've said this to you a hundred times, too, but one of my, my former pastor used to say, this is not heaven. <laughs> heaven is someday. And so when we get to heaven, all things are going to work out wonderfully. But now we're in a place that is not heaven. And so things are going to be tragic, and, and there are going to be hazards, and there are going to be difficulties and ferocious beasts and waves and all the kind of things that happen. But we need to know that God is in the midst. God is in the midst. Perfection is what we have to look forward to in eternity, and I can't wait to that perfection in my life. How about you? No more worry, 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 what if, what if, what if anymore at all. <laughs> anyway, Christians are not naive or protected from the struggles of life. Nothing is more honest uh, than the Bible about those things. It honestly deals with the struggles of man, with this world, and with sin. And Psalm 124 is an instance of a person who digs deeply into trouble and finds the presence of God who is on our side in the midst of it, in the midst of it. What could we do better? What could be more comforting than to look up? Look up. We just need to lift our eyes. Uh, Marilyn talked about that last week in such a, a great way. We need to look up at him, gaze at who he is, gaze at who he is. What could be a better testimony to a hurting world than to see Christians honestly facing the same challenges that they do, but with joy and confidence because of who God is in their lives. And this will embarrass her terribly, but Linda Fuller has been such an example to all of us as she's gone through uh, so many trying things in her life. And I'm sure she has her days. I'm sure she'd tell you she did. But she keeps her gaze up. And she looks and finds and, and observes things that God is doing in the midst of her dif difficulties. How about Debbie Milam, Cindy? What an example of, again, I'm sure she has her days of discouragement and, and, and sadness, but for the most part, keeping her gaze up and watching and looking for God's hand. That's what we all need to, to be, be doing, no matter how small or how big our issues are. I want to see what God, what you're doing, God, in the midst. What are you doing about this issue? I want to watch for your hand. I want to see you um, uh, touching my life in the midst of all that's going on. We trust in a mighty God in the midst of our hazards. Look at verse 8 with me. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made 
heaven and earth. Very similar to Psalm 121, wasn't it? Isn't it? How he made heaven and earth. So A, our help is in the name of the Lord. A look into the heavens can bring a, a breathtaking sense of wonder and majesty. We, uh, many um, uh, uh, of the group leaders, as we were talking in our group leader meeting, mentioned how nature so does that. When we see the sun coming up every day and the sun going down every day and fall happening in some parts of the country. And although, hey, do we have a wonderful day this morning? Yes, oh boy. Um, but when we see nature and, and we see his creation, when we see the ocean and the waves coming in and going out and coming in and going out, that gives us a sense of God is controlling nature. How much more is he controlling his mighty creation called human beings? We don't feel very mighty most of the time, but if, if he controls nature and he cares about us, wouldn't he be controlling uh, our lives? Absolutely. The psalm looks honestly at the realities of life. It looks into the troubles of history and personal conflict and trauma, then turns our gaze to the majesty of God and that, and that he is on our side. Um, we sing words of victory in a world where there is chaos. We can live our lives in joy, even around people who don't understand us and don't, can't figure out this whole Christian thing. What does that mean? And how can you trust, where's God in all this? We can, uh, we can uh, live our lives in joy, even around people who don't understand us, because the content of our lives is God, not man. It's his participation in our lives. Our help is in the name of the Lord. So B, our help is in the name of the Lord. Everything we need is in God. How incredible that our help is in God because we are so helpless, aren't we? We're so helpless. Charles Spurgeon, great thinker, said, we have help in God as troubled sinners, dull scholars, inexperienced travelers, and feeble workers. Isn't that good? We have his help in the midst of that. Troubled sinners, wow, we've been delivered of punishment and guilt. Wow, dull scholars, he teaches us to understand his word because we couldn't comprehend it on our own brains, could we? Wow, inexperienced travelers that were being guided on the right paths on a perilous journey of making our way to our Jerusalem, our a path of ascent to our Jerusalem. Feeble workers, God blessing the work of our hands. God blessing the work of our hands. He is our, uh, he blesses what we do. So see, our help is in the name of the Lord. Our help, it, that's very personal, our help. My help, your help. Uh, it's not just for the super saints, the Billy Grahams of the world. Our help, he is my help, he is your help. It, it's not just for certain particular Christians, it's for every one of us who are seeking his hand in our our lives. We have tested his word and found that he is all he claims, our help, has helped me in the past. He will be my help this very day, and he will be my help forever because Hebrews 13, 8 says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That doesn't mean that, okay, today he's going to be in the midst of axles breaking, but tomorrow, oh my goodness, my whole car is probably going to go right off the road. No, he is our help day after day after day in his way and in his timing. In his timing. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are traveling as pilgrims toward God who is rich in mercy and strong to save us. It is Jesus who defines us, not our culture. Now, let me hasten to say, as we watch all the things going on on the news, as we are listening to debates, and we're thinking about the upcoming primaries, and we start feeling, oh, you know, if my candidate doesn't get, you know, win this thing, oh, where, where are we going to be? And we kind of get really obsessed with what's going on in the world when, guess what? 
God is on the throne. God is well aware of all that's going on in Israel. He is well aware of what is going on uh, catastrophically around our world. He knows. He knows. He knows. And what, we, what do we need to do? We need to trust him. We need to be aware of how he has called us in the midst of it, what we are to do, because he is in control. He is on the throne. The Israel conflict is, he is aware of. He knows everything that's going on in this world. It's in his hands. It is the help we experience, not the hazards that happen that shape our lives. Praise be the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the uh, psalmist has written. We're just about out of hurricane season, and there have been many, many in the Atlantic, and we seems to have, seem to have dodged another bullet. But so often, we are just as diligent. Um, we forget, to, you know, we, we're praying and saying, oh, Lord, just don't make that, that thing uh, hit us, or uh, don't let this thing happen to, to me. And we pray, pray, pray for his hand in our life. But how often do we take time to say, wow, Lord, here we are, it's almost November, and we didn't have a hurricane hit us. How often do we take time to praise him rather than ask him? I mean, well, this is very personal, but when, when um, certain things happen, this happens to be my birthday week. I'm going to be 46. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? Anyway, <laughs> um, some of you believe it. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, um, and I, the thing that I love the most getting from my family and the children are mushy words. Send me something that makes, you know, express it. To me, the gift of words is just means so much to me. Some of you are nodding. Um, don't get me anything, really. Just words would be wonderful. And how much more? We should be giving mushy words to our eternal Father, who in the midst of our difficulties have time and time again had his hand on. That's what we need to focus on. Yes, we ask for his hand in the, in the difficulties and the hazards that come, for sure. But are we spending as much time thanking him when he has uh, wrapped around us and um, showed his hand in us? The times that rather than, oh, Lord, don't you know, make, make this car work right, thank you, Jesus, that it happened in the driveway. I mean, how often do we do that? Where, where we're thanking God, thanking God, praising him, worshiping him for clearly being a part of our lives in the midst of hazards. So closing question, where do you immediately race for help when catastrophe hits and it's going to hit in this world, isn't it? It's going to hit in this world. Where should we race to? Let's encourage each other to praise God his mighty name when things become uh, tragic, uh, difficulty and challenging. Uh, I read this verse a couple of weeks ago, but it's so helpful to remember, to encourage each other um, about who our help really is. It's Malachi 3.16. And then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. I love this. And the Lord paid attention and heard them, and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. In other words, when we're praising him and saying to each other, oh my goodness, you cannot believe what God did in the midst of this hazard of my life, and, 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 you're, and oh wow, well let me tell you what he did for me last week. And when we're saying that to each other, when we're praising the Lord and and honoring him and, and looking to him and re remembering what he's done, apparently a book of, of uh, is written with our names in it. Mm -hmm. How amazing is that? And uh, that we're honoring the Lord, that he listens and pays attention, and uh, that, that he's, he is honored by the fact that we're thanking him and, and uh, esteeming him and praising him to one another. Wow. Let's pray together. And Heavenly Father, yes, all of us 
all of us, all of us, have or will face hazards of varying degrees in this world because we live in a sin-filled world. Thank you that as we know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we're headed to that perfection called heaven. Thank you that all of the catastrophes, all of the hazards, all of the difficulties, all of the challenges will be done when we ascend into our holy Jerusalem called heaven. And Lord, as we go through the hazards that are going to come our way, may we be like the psalmist that we've just studied and say our help is from the Lord. Praise the Lord. May we look for your hand. May we observe your hand in our lives as we go through those hazards. And may we talk about them to each other. May we praise your name to one another because we know that that blesses your heart. We know how it feels when, when we are blessed by people that we love that say things to us that, that are so meaningful. Yes, we need to be doing that with you, benevolent, wonderful, all-powerful, all-loving Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you for participating so hugely in our lives. Thank you that you have a plan for each one of us. Thank you, Lord. We want to praise you and honor you for who you are in each of our lives. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that made it all possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you.